Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the morphology of red blood cells. All right, let's get started. So this presentation is about the morphology of the red blood cells. So what is the point of knowing red blood cell morphologies? So the appearance of red blood cells can help us to identify many hematological diseases. Abnormalities of red blood cells can indicate various types of anemias, thalassemias, which are a, a group of inherited disorders uh, that cause a decreased rate of the production of globin chains, which are part of the hemoglobin molecule. Um, also hemoglobinopathies, which are very similar to thalassemias in that they are an inherited group of disorders that affect the hemoglobin, um, but these are disorders that cause abnormal globin chains within the molecule. A red cell morphology can also help us to identify certain neoplasms, which are abnormal growths that could potentially be cancerous. So now that we know why uh, we have to know the normal and abnormal morphology of red blood cells, how do we test for it in the first place? Uh, so this is performed on an EDTA tube, uh, so a lavender top tube, in something that we call a complete blood count with differential. Uh, and a complete blood count with differential is frequently abbreviated as CBC with diff. It's run on a hematology analyzer, um, and if the analyzer detects that everything is normal, it can, it can be auto-reported if the laboratory has auto-verify enabled. Uh, if it's abnormal, oftentimes it requires a manual differential, and this is where a peripheral blood smear needs to be made of the patient's sample. Then it gets stained with a right gene stain, and then it's looked at under the microscope by a laboratory uh, professional. Now the CBC is going to give uh, red blood cell indices, so MCV, MCH, MCHC, and RDW. Now I've created a separate video on what those are and how to calculate those indices, so please check that out. I will link it in uh, the description of this video. Now if a manual differential is performed, the laboratory professional must manually look at uh, the red blood cells and report out their morphology. Now, as with any hematology sample in an EDTA tube, the blood in the tube cannot contain any clots, uh, as we are going to be counting and looking at the contents in that tube. And, and if it is clotted, all the contents in that tube that we'd be looking at are all going to be clotted up. So if there are clots, the tube must be rejected and redrawn. So now that we know why we care about and how we test for morphology of red blood cells, what kinds of things are we even looking for? Uh, so this gives a summation of all the different morphological features that we uh, need to be able to identify in a patient's peripheral blood smear. Uh, and when I say morphological features, I'm saying referring to the red blood cell morphology. Uh, we also look at and identify white blood cells as well. Uh, so we look at the size of the red blood cell, and this is indicated by the MCV indice, which is uh, mean cell volume or mean corpuscular volume. Uh, we look at the color of the red blood cell. This is indicated by the MCHC indice, which is mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Uh, we also look at the shape of the red blood cell. And if you notice, all these things I mentioned have lists associated with them. So, for example, under the shape, poikilocytosis, echinocyte, et cetera, those are under the shape. Uh, so we're going to talk about all of these within this presentation. And, and yes, you do need to recognize them all. So in addition to size, color, and shape of the red blood cells, as medical laboratory professionals, we need to be able to distinguish between agglutination of red blood cells and something we call Rouleau. Well, again, we'll talk about this here uh, later on in this presentation. Our red blood cells can also have something we call um, inclusions, uh, which is material that, are in, that is inside the red blood cell. Uh, parasites can also invade the red blood cell, and we need to be able to identify those as well in our profession. So again, I have, had, I have a separate video on the red blood cell indices. And again, I'm going to link that in the description below. So two of these indices are MCV, or mean cell or mean corpuscular volume, and MCHC, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. MCV is the average volume of the red blood cells in a patient's bloodstream. And MCV corresponds to the red blood cell size. 
If the patient has a normal MCV, their red blood cells will be normal size and are referred to as normocytic red blood cells. Now for MCHC, this refers to the average concentration of hemoglobin present in the red blood cells in the patient's bloodstream. It corresponds to the color of the red blood cell. If a patient has a normal MCHC value, it's called normochromic. A good way to think of MCHC is to look at the central pallor of the red blood cell. And central pallor refers to the lightening of color in the center of the red blood cell. So I'm gonna get a red laser pointer here and, and show you. Uh, this is what I'm referring to. This is central pallor, all right? So this here is central pallor. This lightning color in the red blood cell. These are all normal, all right? Um, so a normal red blood cell is gonna have this much central pallor. If it has an increased MCHC value, the red blood cells are gonna have a decreased central pallor, right? So basically it's gonna be like kind of like this cell right here. You see how there's like very little central pallor if if at any, um, that is what we call um, something that's gonna have an MCHC uh, that is higher than normal. Um, so if the MCHC value is decreased, they will have an increased central pallor. So again, um, these are um, normal looking red blood cells. Um, and here of course is a little platelet and a cute little segmented neutrophil. Um, so a normal red blood cell or normal cytic normal, sorry, we'll talk about normochromic here, is going to be like this, right? And then one that's hyperchromic is going to be like this. Oh my goodness, I kind of screwed that up. Let's, let's erase some of that. Oh goodness, it did the whole thing. Okay, so a hyperchromic is going to be basically all the way red. There's going to be no central pallor. And then a hypochromic is gonna be a big area of uh, central pallor. Now for <clears throat> size, so normocytic is gonna be like, let's say this size, all right? Uh, an increase size, which we're gonna refer to as macrocytic, we'll talk about here in a second, is gonna be like this, right? And microcytic is gonna be smaller in comparison. And again, we're gonna break these all down and talk about them here momentarily. But this is a, a peripheral blood smear that is normocytic normochromic. All right, so these are what we call microcytes, right? So for example, this is a microcyte, this is a microcyte. Not all of these are microcytes. Um, this here is a white blood cell that we call lymphocyte, right? Uh, so now when I talk about microcytes, this is referring to the size of the red blood cell. This patient has a low MCV indice. And honestly, this person also probably has a decreased MCHC as well. So if you look at these red blood cells, they're of course small, so they are considered microcytes, but they also have an increased central power. Like look at this cell right here. Look at this cell here. There's like a huge increase of uh, central power. So they probably have a decreased MCHC. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> There are a lot of different reasons a patient may have microcytes present in their bloodstream. Uh, iron deficiency anemia, or IDA, uh, which is the most common form of anemia in the United States. Uh, and this is caused by poor diets, pregnancy, potentially a really excessive menstrual flow, uh, chronic blood loss, those sorts of things. Uh, microcytes can also be present in patients that have sideroblastic anemia, uh, which in a super quick summation is uh, basically where a patient has anemia uh, because uh, due to a lack of red blood cells and too much iron in the blood because there are not enough red blood cells to utilize uh, up that iron. Now, anemia of chronic disease, uh, which is anemia in patients who are chronically ill, and thalassemias, which recall is a group of inherited disorders that cause a decreased rate of production of globin chains in the hemoglobin molecule. So these smaller than normal size red blood cells are called microcytes. Macrocytes are again referring to the size of the red blood cell. So when we see uh, cytic, normocytic, macrocytic, microcytic, we're referring to the size of the red blood cell. Uh, this patient uh, in this peripheral blood smear picture has an increased MCV indice, so larger than normal red blood cells. So if you look at it, this is a normal red blood cell size. Okay, look at this one. That one's a huge one. That's a macrocyte, right? And then, of course, 
this is a platelet, and this is a lymphocyte. Um, so these are macrocytes, right? So macrocytes can be present in patients with megaloblastic anemia, uh, which is anemia that is caused by deficiencies of vitamin B12 and folate. Uh, we'll learn about vitamin B12 and folate in our clinical chemistry course. Uh, there can be non-megaloblastic anemia causes like liver disease or alcoholism uh, that can cause macrocytes um, as well, but primarily you want to associate these macrocytes with a vitamin B12 uh, and folate deficiency. So we've been talking about the sizes of red blood cells and how they relate to MCV. So as a recap, if a patient has a normal MCV, their red blood cells are going to be normal size and they're referred to as normocytes. If the patient has an increased MCV, their red blood cells are larger than normal and they are called macrocytes. And if the patient has a decreased MCV, they're going to have red cells uh, that are smaller than normal and those are called microcytes. Then we have something called a nesocytosis. And this means that there is a variation in the size of red blood cells. So generally indicating um, a dimorphic population. And dimorphic population means that there are two circulating red blood cell populations. So this can occur if a patient receives a red blood cell uh, transfusion, meaning they get a unit or units of donor blood. So the circulating blood in their bloodstream will be both the patient's red blood cells and the donor's red blood cells. So some of them may be bigger um, than the, the uh, patient's blood or vice versa. Anisocytosis can also occur when a patient has a deficiency in two different things, like a deficiency of both vitamin B12 and a deficiency of iron. And anisocytosis is measured using something we call red cell distribution width, or RDW. Um, and like MCV and MCHC, RDW is a red blood cell indice. When RDW is increased, the patient will have anisocytosis. Again, uh, please check out my video on red blood cell indices. I do discuss RDW here. Now, if we look at this peripheral blood smear picture on the left-hand side of this slide here, you can see this is somebody that has a dimorphic population of red blood cells, and they have an increased RDW or increased red cell distribution width, and we would be calling anisocytosis on this patient. Now, if you look at it here, you can tell that there's definitely something going on here, right? So what is it? So there's some normal looking red blood cells. So I'm just gonna put, point out a couple, like look at these, right? These I would consider very normocytic, all right? But look at this one, and look at this one, and this one, this one. See, so these are macrocytes, right? So we have a lot of macrocytes, and then we have some normocytes here, right? And it's very clear here. Now, if we had this patient, right, like I would be looking at um, the CBC printoff results from my analyzer, and it would tell me what the RDW was. So if we have an increased RDW looking at that, that printoff, looking at those patients results that would kind of give me a good indication of hey i'm going to check out this peripheral blood smear i bet you they have anisocytosis and then i would confirm it visually by looking at the manual differential and say yep yep there's definitely some anisocytosis going on here there's some macrocytes and some normocytes and you know it's 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 very clearly a dimorphic population so i'd use that rdw and my eyes looking at the slide to call anisocytosis and a lot of times laboratories will have um, a specific um, uh, number of RDW, so it has to be, you know, like usually it's like greater than 15. Um, if the patient's um, RDW is greater than 15 and you see it on the slide, they like you to call a certain number of anisocytosis, um, depending on how, how great that RDW is. But of course, that is laboratory specific, so follow whatever your policy is uh, for calling um, basically anything that we're discussing today. So these are what hypochromic red cells uh, look like. So they have an increased central pallor, which refers to uh, the lightening of color in the center of uh, the red blood cell. Uh, so these cells have an increased central pallor, so they're referred to as hypochromic. So if you look here, I'm gonna use my pointer. See how this cell has this huge area of lightning, lightening? Makes it sound like I'm talking about thunder and lightning. That's not what I'm saying, I'm lightening. Um, in the middle of the cell, so it's hyper, hypochromic, right? Um, so uh, this is associated 
with a decreased MCH level. So the same thing with like anisocytosis and hyperchromasia and microcytes and all those things. Um, you would look at the red blood cell indice from the um, results of the CBC on the analyzer and it would give you that the MCV and the MCHC right and the RDW and for hypochromasia and hyperchromasia you're going to look at the MCHC value um, and if it's decreased so I'm going to look at that say oh it's decreased this MCHC on this patient is decreased probably when I look at the manual differential I'm going to see hypochromic red blood cells and that's when I would call it so you want to use them together you don't want to just look at you know, look at these red blood cells and not pay attention to the patient's CBC and say, oh, I think I see hypochromasia. You always want to report back to that red blood cell indice and take a look at it. Um, so uh, patients um, with iron deficiency anemia or IDA, sideroblastic anemia, anemia of chronic disease, and those with thalassemia can have hypochromic red blood cells. We've talked about all those different diseases here uh, briefly within this presentation, so I'm not going to uh, uh, go back over them. Now, hyperchromasia or hyperchromatic red blood cells are associated with an increased MCHC. So some macrocytes, so larger than normal red blood cells, can be hyperchromic, but it's usually associated with something called spherocytes, which we'll talk about here momentarily. So again, I'm going to use this red pointer here. So you see how there's definitely some macrocytes here too, right? But let me let me delete that here. All right. So this is a spherocyte here, or basically what we're talking about is hyperchromasia. They're also spherocytes, um, which again we'll talk about uh, here in a moment. Um, but again, remember hypochromasia cells or hyperchromatic cells, they're going to have a huge area of central pallor, whereas hyperchromic red blood cells are going to have basically no central pallor. All right, so th those are hyperchromic red blood cells. And again, it's going to be associated with an increased MCHC value. Polychromasia is where the red blood cell has a slightly blue tinge to it when stained with a right stain. And now if you check out uh, my video on erythrocytes, you can hear a little bit more detail about polychromasia. Uh, but a quick summary is that these are immature red blood cells. Now it's normal to see a super small amount of these in the peripheral blood. If you work in a laboratory that has a labor and delivery unit at their hospital, you'll see these more frequently. Uh, these are common in neonatal blood, so babies that are just born. Uh, they can also be seen if a patient is hemorrhaging, so bleeding massively, or if they are experiencing hemolysis, which is the premature lysis of the red blood cells. So for hemorrhaging and hemolysis, we um, are prematurely losing red blood cells. And so in this situation, the bone marrow tries to compensate. It's like, ah, we need more and we need more red blood cells because we're losing them prematurely. So it kicks into gear and starts generating more red blood cells as quickly as it can. And it pushes out these not fully mature red blood cells to try to compensate for those, the, uh, those red blood cells that are being lost. So now when you see these in a smear with a right Gimsa stain, um, they appear like this, um, and they're referred to as polychromasia. So let me get my pointer out here. So this is that kind of bluish tint red blood cell uh, that we're talking about. This is polychromasia. And you can tell too as well, they're just slightly larger uh, than normal red blood cells as well. Um, and um, if you listen to my other lectures on uh, erythrocytes, um, you know that um, baby red blood cells are going to be larger and they get smaller and smaller and smaller until they're mature. So it would make sense that a slightly immature form of a red blood cell is going to be a little, little bit uh, larger uh, than a normal red blood cell. So again, um, in a right game sustain, which is uh, the stain that we do peripheral blood smears on, they appear like this and they're called polychromasia. Now to confirm that these are in fact these immature red blood cells, uh, a peripheral blood smear can be stained with uh, a new methylene blue stain. And when seen with the new methylene blue stain, uh, these polychromatic cells are referred to as reticulocytes or retics. And a percentage of reticulocytes can be counted using this stain. Uh, they used to do those manually. Uh, but nowadays, retics can actually be counted via an automated hematology analyzer. So now these are called echinocytes. Um, they're also referred to, it, to as Burr cells. 
Uh, these have uh, evenly spaced spine-like projections, as you can see here on the pictures on the left-hand side. Uh, these can be seen in patients with uremia, which is when the kidneys are not working appropriately to filter out waste products from the blood. Uh, it can also be seen in patients who are receiving heparin therapy, um, and heparin is given to, pr uh, to prevent blood clots. Uh, patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency or PK deficiency can also have echinocytes in their bloodstream. Um, this is a genetic disorder. And also echinocytes uh, can um, be seen as artifact on the slide. So this means it happens when the blood smear is made manually. So these are echinocytes or Burr cells. Now, not to be confused with echinocytes, acanthocytes are another abnormal red blood cell morphology. Uh, these are also referred to as spur cells. So echinocytes are called Burr cells, acanthocytes are called spur cells. Um, and these spur cells actually look very similar to echinocytes. Uh, the difference here is that acanthocytes have irregular spicules of varying length. And recall that echinocytes have evenly spaced projections. Uh, patients can get spur cells in their blood after they have their spleen removed. Uh, patients that have liver disease caused by alcoholism, and also something called abetalipoproteinemia. Now, I talk about this disorder in my clinical chemistry lectures, uh, but in, in uh, very simple terms, uh, this is a genetic disorder that affects the absorption of fat uh, in the intestine. So these are acanthocytes, and so you can see, like I said, they're very similar to echinocytes, but you can see that they're projections are not as uniform as echinocytes. So you see how this projection is kind of like this, and then there's a space here, and then there's a lot of space here, and there's another one, there's tons of space here, there's some projections here. It's just kind of sporadic, where like an echinocyte would be like, you know, all the same. That's a really bad description. <laughs> Let me see if I can do it a little bit better. So it's just going to have the same length of spicules all around it. It's kind of hard to draw, but okay. So it kind of started to have the same amount where this is like, and here, and here. All right, that's going to be an acanthocyte. Hopefully that helps. These red blood cells are called stomatocytes. Uh, they kind of look like they have a slit-like mouth appearance to their central uh, pallor. Let me show you here. So this is actually a really good example of one here. So it kind of looks like this is the red blood cell. It kind of the central pallor kind of looks like this. All right, so that's what we mean by a slit-like or mouth-like appearance of central pallor. Uh, these cells are seen in patients that have hereditary stomatocytosis, also in those with liver disease and alcoholism. Uh, patients with Rh null disease, uh, which you'll learn about in blood banking, can develop these stomatocytes as well. Uh, now, red blood cells have a ton of different antigens present on them, and one of those is the Rh antigen. Um, in Rh null disease, patients have a lack of expression of all Rh antigens. And again, you'll learn all about this in blood banking. Um, so stomatocytes can also appear on the peripheral smear as artifact. Uh, they're frequent in slides that are made with albumin. Um, so sometimes in hematology, you will want to prepare a peripheral blood smear with albumin in cases where there are smudge cells. So smudge cells are uh, white blood cells that get damaged in the process of making the smear. Um, and adding albumin can prevent this breakage, so that way you can properly identify what white blood cells are getting damaged. Um, so with albumin smears, however, you cannot evaluate the red blood cell morphology as they can create false stomatocytes. So in a situation where you're doing an albumin um, smear, uh, you would want to count and differentiate the white blood cells on that albumin smear, but look at the red blood cell morphology on the original peripheral smear, not on the albumin smear. Drapanocytes, or sickle cells, are thin, elongated, crescent-shaped red blood cells that have pointed ends. Uh, these cells contain hemoglobin S, which is an abnormal hemoglobin type, and are seen in sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. Uh, these red blood cells polymerize into this shape when there is a decrease of uh, blood pH or with a decrease in oxygen. They are frequently seen with codocytes, um, which are also called target cells. So this is actually a really, really great 
example of a drepanocyte or a sickle cell. Here's another one here. Oh goodness, I just completely... It's a lot harder to write with a mouse than you would think. So here's another drepanocyte. So um, I also mentioned codocyte, which we'll talk about on the next slide, but a codocyte or target cell, this is an example of one. And you can see it like, I mean, it literally looks like a, a bullseye right in the center. Here's another codocyte. So a lot of times um, codocytes will be present uh, with drepanocytes. All right, so here's a codocyte here. So um, again, it's gonna have that bullseye target looking um, center. Um, so uh, these, uh, um, again, are codocytes or target cells. Um, and uh, of course, they're called those target cells because they literally look like a target with a bullseye center. So uh, patients that have um, codocytes, um, these are seen in iron deficiency anemia or IDA, uh, hemoglobinopathy, thalassemia, uh, liver disease, um, and also with peop people with sickle cell anemia. And we've talked about all those disorders here in this presentation already. The cryocytes are also called teardrop cells. And I can remember this name because there is cry literally in the cryocyte. And this helps me to remember that it, that's the fancy term for teardrop cells. These literally look like teardrops. Um, these can be seen in patients with myelofibrosis, which is a type of blood cancer, and also in thalassemias and megaloblastic anemias, which we've talked about already. Now, if you're evaluating a peripheral blood smear and you see decryocytes all going in one direction, this is likely an artifact and not true decryocyte. So here's a really good example of a decryocyte, right? So if in this peripheral smear, you saw all of these the cryocytes going in the exact same direction as this one, right? This is likely an artifact um, and it's made by the smear um, kind of pushing the red blood cells in the same direction. So if you see them where they're all um, in different locations or different directions, those are probably true to cryocytes. Now, schistocytes are fragmented red blood cells. They are created with the red blood cell, uh, when the red blood cell hits uh, fibrin strands and then they rupture. Uh, they're important even if one schistocyte is seen per field when performing a manual differential. They can be, can be seen in microangiopathic anemias like disseminated intravascular coagulation, hemolytic uremia syndrome, or something called TTP. So disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC is a rare issue when there is abnormal blood clotting throughout the body. Hemolytic uremia syndrome, or HUS, is a disease that affects the kidneys and the clotting of blood. And TTP is a rare disorder that causes clotting in small blood vessels. So schistocytes are very important to identify when doing a peripheral blood smear. So that's a schistocyte. This is a schistocyte. This is a schistocyte here. And this one here, here's a schistocyte. This is actually a platelet right there. And this is a platelet that's on top of a red blood cell. And this cell here is actually an echinocyte. And you, you, uh, can, you should know that because the projections are uniform all around the, the edge of the cell, right? So that's an echinocyte. These are called elliptocytes or ovalocytes. Uh, these are oval to elongated red blood cells. They can look like cigars or they can look like even egg shaped. Uh, these are associated with red cell uh, membrane protein disorders. Uh, patients will have elliptocytes when they have hereditary elliptocytosis, iron deficiency anemia, uh, megaloblastic anemia, and uh, thalassemia. Now these are spherocytes. Uh, hopefully you remember that term as I've talked about these previously in the lecture uh, when talking about MCHC. Um, so this is a spherocyte, this is a spherocyte, um, so, and like this is a spherocyte. Those are examples of the spherocytes uh, in uh, this particular picture. So spherocytes have an increased MCHC and therefore are hyperchromic. Uh, they're also smaller, so they have a decreased MCV. They do not have central pallor, so uh, remember central pallor is 
you know, like for example, this little lightning in uh, the center of the cell. So you see these, these uh, spherocytes do not have that. Um, so patients have uh, spherocytes when they have, of course, hereditary spherocytosis, uh, G6PD deficiency, which is a type of enzyme deficiency uh, that prevents red blood cells from properly functioning. Uh, immune hemolytic anemia can also cause uh, spherocytosis, and this is when a patient develops antibodies to the antigens on their own red blood cells, and that causes the red blood cells to lyse. And of course, if these uh, red blood cells are prematurely lysing, uh, the patient is be going to become anemic. Now, in the next three slides here, we're going to be discussing agglutination and Rouleau. I figure it would be better to show you examples of them and then discuss the differences between the two. So this slide um, shows red blood cell agglutination. So the picture um, on the left is actually a picture I took of the blood of a former patient of mine. Uh, this patient had a severe cold autoantibody, which I'll explain in a couple slides from now. And as you can see, uh, the blood on the slide is agglutinating or clumping together spontaneously at room temperature. Now the right hand photo shows a peripheral blood smear uh, showing classic agglutination under the microscope. See how the red blood cells are clumped together? Uh, the red blood cells are just in a big piles. So this is agglutination. So here's an example, right? So they're all clumped together. Um, that is agglutination. Now, uh, this photo on the left-hand side shows a peripheral blood smear with something called Rouleau under the microscope, uh, which we'll get uh, into more detail on the next slide. So you can see the difference here between agglutination. Um, these red blood cells are kind of stacked together like coins. Um, so for example, this here, this here, you know, a lot of these are stacked together like coins. Um, so this is classic Rouleau, and I'll talk about what causes this here on the next slide. So what are the fundamental differences between agglutination and Rouleau? Agglutination is caused by an antigen antibody reaction, uh, most commonly caused by a cold autoantibody. And you'll learn more about cold autoantibodies in your blood banking courses. Uh, but this is, uh, these are when the body develops an antibody to their own antigens present on their red blood cells, um, reacting at temperatures that are much colder than body temperature. So this antigen antibody reaction causes the red blood cells to clump together or agglutinate at room temperature. Um, and this uh, doesn't pose a problem uh, in the patient because obviously their blood is not at room temperature in their body. It only poses a problem uh, when a patient's blood is drawn and the blood of course eventually gets to room temperature and of course it can affect testing because it's agglutinating. So the best way to mediate this in the laboratory for testing is to warm the sample to 37 degrees Celsius, which is uh, body temperature. So warm that at body temperature for 15 minutes. And after that 15 minute time period, rerun the sample. Um, and usually that will correct it. In hematology, uh, you can detect this issue uh, pretty quickly while running an automated complete blood count. You'll get a falsely decreased red blood cell count and a super high MCHC value. So honestly, the big indicator here is the MCHC value. I've actually had um, MCHs, MCHCs of 80 plus for patients that have this cold agglutinin issue. And obviously that value just is not correct. It's never, uh, an MCHC is never gonna be 80 or more um, on, a, on a patient. Um, so in this case, you warm the sample, rerun it, and that MCHC will correct. Now in Rouleau, uh, this is where the red cells kind of stack on top of each other. Um, and this is associated with something called multiple myeloma, which is a type of blood cancer. Uh, this shouldn't cause an issue with the instrument getting results, but if so, you can use saline to try to displace those red blood cells from each other. Basophilic stippling is the first red blood cell inclusion that we're going to learn about. These are many tiny inclusions that are evenly dispersed throughout the red blood cell. These are actually aggregated ribosomal RNA remnants, uh, which stain a dark blue with the right stain. These inclusions can be seen in megaloblastic and sideroblastic anemias, 
uh, thalassemias, alcoholism, and when the patient has been exposed to toxic levels of lead. This photo shows bite cells, which show uh, what you would see in a right stain, and Heinz bodies, which you will see in a super vital stain like numethylene blue. Heinz bodies are multiple inclusions caused by denatured hemoglobin. And the, these, uh, these multiple inclusions are invisible in a right stain, uh, causing these bite cells. So it looks like the, like the cookie monster has taken a bite out of the red blood cell in a right stain. If the blood sample is stained with that new methylene blue stain, then you would be able to see the actual inclusions of the denatured hemoglobin. Um, these cells can occur in patients with G6PD deficiencies, which we've talked about before, uh, thalassemias, hemoglobinopathies, and drug-induced anemias. This photo shows a great example of a cabot ring in a peripheral blood smear. Uh, so these cabot rings are thin reddish violet rings uh, that appear in loops or even in like a figure eight pattern. And these are caused by the fragmentation of nuclear material within the red blood cell. Patients with megaloblastic or pernicious anemia can have these, as well as those that have been poisoned with lead. And I can't recall if I've already discussed uh, myelodysplastic syndromes within this lecture, but uh, these are disorders of the bone marrow uh, that disrupt the production of normal red blood cells. So patients with these syndromes can have cabot rings. Uh, these are actually really, really rare. I actually can't think of a single time that I've seen a cabot ring um, like live in person uh, working in the field. How jolly bodies are small, round, dark blue, eccentrically uh, located bodies in the red blood cell. Uh, these can be seen in patients that have had their spleen removed um, in those with sickle cell anemia, uh, thalassemias, uh, very severe hemolytic anemias, and those with megaloblastic anemias. Pappenheimer bodies are small, irregular iron granules that are frequently clumped together in the red blood cell. Pappenheimer bodies can be confirmed by staining the blood with a Prussian uh, blue stain. Uh, iron stains with this stain, and since Pappenheimers are granules of iron, uh, these will show up directly with that stain. Uh, these are seen in disorders like sideroblastic and megaloblastic anemias, uh, which we've already discussed, and also hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias. A lot of times students will get these confused uh, with basophilic stippling, and the, the main takeaway here is, let me show you with a laser point. Let's, I'm gonna try to draw a red blood cell here. Okay, so two red blood cells, right? So with basophilic stippling, the dots, the inclusions are all over and uniform throughout the red blood cell, all right? So that's basophilic stippling. Now for Pappenheimer bodies, it's just like a couple that are clumped together to one side, right? So that's the difference between basophilic stippling and Pappenheimer bodies. Hopefully that helps. Students really tend to struggle with those at first. Siderocytes are mature red blood cells that contain iron granules. Sideroblasts are normal within the bone marrow. Uh, sideroblasts are nucleated red blood cells, so immature red blood cells uh, that are present within the bone marrow and these uh, specifically contain iron granules. Now, ring sideroblasts are those that have iron that sort of encircled the nucleus of the red blood cell, and these are actually abnormal and are, and are present in some myelodysplastic syndromes. An increase of siderocytes is associated with patients that have had their spleens removed, and also when the patient has a hemoglobinopathy or thalassemia. The arrows in the photo are pointing to hemoglobin C crystals, Hemoglobin C is an abnormal type of hemoglobin. Uh, these are very condensed, elongated rectangulars, uh, rectangular shapes uh, that resemble the Washington Monument. For those of you who are not in the United States, I've included what the Washington Monument is. Uh, it's on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, this is located in Washington, D.C. in the United States of America. Uh, now, you will often uh, see target cells or codocytes in patients that have these crystals present in their peripheral bloodstream. Hemoglobin SC crystals are from a cross between hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. Uh, they can be curved rectangles or bizarre shapes that kind of look like a mitten or finger-like projections. Uh, like with hemoglobin C crystals, you will frequently see target cells or codocytes present in the peripheral blood smear of patients that have uh, these hemoglobin SC crystals. Uh, the arrows in the left-hand photo uh, point to these crystal types. 
Sometimes parasites can be seen in the red blood cells. Uh, this particular parasite is malaria. It's spread by the female Anopheles mosquito. This occurs most often in uh, Africa and causes flu-like symptoms like fever and chills. Although this is primarily in Africa, it's estimated by the Centers for Disease Control uh, that around 2,000 cases of malaria are diagnosed every year in the United States. Uh, so it is possible if you are working in the U.S. in a lab um, that you may see this. I've seen a couple of, of malaria smears um, within my, my career as a, a laboratory professional. There are a couple of different types of malaria. Uh, but the most dangerous is uh, called Plasmodium falciparum. Um, you will see these ring-like structures in the red blood cells. Uh, the parasite grows within the red blood cell, then bursts open and affects more red blood cells as they multiply. Um, and so this can be de definitely very deadly. Uh, so it's very important that we catch malaria on a peripheral blood smear. Babesia is another intracellular parasite, meaning that you will see it present inside the red blood cells. Uh, this is spread by a bite from a tick and is primarily present in the Northeast and Upper Midwest of the United States. Uh, some patients that are infected with this intracellular parasite are actually asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any symptoms, um, and others have like a flu-like illness. Um, it can be severe as the infection can cause hemolytic anemia, so the premature rupture or lysing of the red blood cells. Uh, so it's also very important that we catch it when doing manual differentials. Now, uh, the hallmark of Babesia infection is the Maltese cross, and you can see a really good example in this particular red blood cell. So if you hear a, a really good um, a thought is if you word associate Babesia with Maltese cross, like if uh, on the board, if they ever ask you about Maltese cross, it's Babesia. That's just always going to be the answer. Um, so you want to associate that. You see a Maltese cross, it's Babesia infection. Trypanosoma cruzi is another bloodborne parasite. It's present in, in Latin America and it's transmitted by the Reduvid bug, which is pictured in the bottom right hand uh, part of this slide. Uh, this causes something called Chagas disease, which is characterized by swelling, fever and fatigue, headache, rash, etc. Um, this is the parasite that you will see in the preferred blood smear uh, for a patient that has Trypanosoma cruzi infection. Now, Trypanosoma brucei is a bloodborne parasite as well. Uh, this is present in African countries and tr is transmitted by the bite of the tsetse fly. It's responsible for something we call African sleeping sickness, uh, which causes fatigue, very high fever, muscle aches, and even death. And if you can see here, these cool looking things are that intracellular, I'm sorry, not intracellular, that flagellated, uh, flagellated uh, parasites. So they're not intracellular. If they were intracellular, they would actually be like within the red blood cell. They're not. They're just hanging out uh, within the bloodstream. Alrighty, so that concludes the end of this lecture. Uh, if this video helped you out, go ahead and give it a like and please make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And until next time.